This episode of Egalia Chats is brought to you by Egalia and our brand new Servo Collective, a community funding drive to support development of Servo, the only web engine to be written in a memory-safe programming language with modularity, embeddability, and parallel computing in mind. Visit servo.org to learn more and opencollective.com slash servo to lend your support. Hi, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. Hey, uh, my name's Keith Circle. I work for GitHub on the Primer design system team. And uh, we wanted to have Keith on because uh, recently Keith filed a Chromium intent that is near and dear to uh, a topic that Eric and I uh, have been talking about for years and years and years which is about headings. And we, there's a whole bunch of things we would like to talk about in this, like the history and like how we, how we got to here and what the problem is. But Keith, do you think that you can describe the, the basic problem that this is aimed at solving? So I can kind of talk from GitHub's perspective, but I think there's like a general case here, which is around user-generated content. Like if you're writing a document and you own all of the stuff that goes in the document, like all of the source, you can mark up a document structure that is H1 at the top, H2, and then underneath each H2, there's H3s and so on, right? And that is how a sensible document is laid out. It's like kind of chapters in a book. You know, it starts with the title, there's chapter titles, there's subtitles and so on. The problem comes with like user-generated content and especially for a site like GitHub, uh, user-generated content can come in different places and like we call them markdown surfaces so you can have like a comment which is one markdown surface or a readme which is another and those are injected into documents at different points right so like an issue will have an h1 which is the issue title uh, it'll then have h2s for example the like uh, this user commented so the your markdown comment starts at h3 but a lot of people just write the hashtag, like a single hashtag for an H1 if they want to create their own mini document within that. Right. So we need to somehow fix that up. But then there's also a problem, which is we can fix that up okay, but then we don't always know where those things are going. So a readme, for example, you might think it always starts at an H1, but if it's on GitHub, the repository title is the H1. And so the readme should start at an H2. But that's not the case, for example, if you're looking at a readme in like VS Code, right? Because that's the H1. So it's actually impossible for us to know from a piece of user-generated content until it's in the document where it should lie in the heading structure. And maybe you can talk more about the history of this, but once upon a time, there was this idea that like documents would be able to outline themselves <laughs> But that kind of fell apart, I guess. I, I, it seems like none of the browsers, or it's too complicated to implement or something. Yeah. So I, I love the history of this. I mention it a lot. But like this problem, when you think about it, is like kind of obvious that you would run into this problem, right? So like, why did we even get to where we are with that being a problem? <laughs> the story that I like to tell is that in the very first like real thing that Tim Berners-Lee sent about HTML to the mailing list he set up to talk about HTML in 1991, he said, I would prefer instead of H1, H2, etc. for headings to have a nestable section element and a generic H, which at any level within the sections would produce the required level of heading. So this is a lot like we could also have had like an ordered list which used actual numbers, but we didn't, <laughs> right? Right, just LIs and you count on the user agent to do the counting for you. Yeah, and yeah. so if you nest them, it doesn't matter where you nest them because it will be taken care of for you. And it seems like a very obvious kind of solution. And he said in it why we wound up that way because Tim invented HTML in a lot the same way that Doug Crockford invented JSON, right? which is mostly like he discovered and popularized it. There were a lot of documents at CERN that already used this DTD. It goes all the way back to SGML in like the 60s. And unsurprisingly, 
the elements that were really popular are sort of the same ones you see in Markdown or a rich text editor, just like bold, <laughs> italic, bullets, you know, just these really simple semantics, which are like somehow about text itself. And then what happened is when we began using computers, we still were thinking about it like that. And we processed them linearly like a document. And so we just thought like, okay, well, there's a, the big heading, that's H1. And then the, the slightly smaller heading is H2. And so we wound up with this terrible thing. And then finally in HTML5, Ian Hickson thought, let's fix that. So created this thing called the document outline. And maybe Eric, can you sort of explain the... I, I'm not sure that I can. I mean, <laughs> that's part of the problem. But it was, my understanding is that it was more or less the same as what Tim was talking about originally, which was, we'll just have sort of generic heading levels, or sorry, generic heading elements, and the levels will be programmatically determined. So you could get back to that thing that Tim wanted to do. So the, the rub here, I guess, is that, like, there's not a mode switch or something where you could say this one works the new way and that one works the old way. And then mm. there is always this, like, what is its fallback behavior and stuff. And so uh, Hixie's proposal was that H1 basically is the H and that, you know, it will work a very particular way. The part that was really easy to implement about that was the user agent style sheet. So, that was implemented in all the browsers. And so if you had a section and inside that you had an H1, and then inside that section you had another section and you had an H1, and inside that section you had another section and you had an H1, those headings would get progressively smaller. So people thought that it worked. Right. But it didn't work because the actual semantics in terms of like accessibility technology didn't change. So it never communicated itself as a h2 h3 basically you know mm. and it is actually this mixed problem and the fallback problem that made it really complicated to solve and so in 2015 steve faulkner opened issue 83 in html and i think that this topic has spawned more gigathreads than any other topic in html history and burned more time than any topic in html history but it's 83 was open in 2015 by Steve Faulkner that said, hey, maybe we ought to admit that the document outline doesn't really exist. <laughs> like maybe we should make a note that nobody has actually implemented it. And it's sort of like probably actively harmful if people think that it does. So maybe we should get rid of that. And right. Because the if the visible structure to like a sighted user looks fine, but actually for a user using an assistive technology like a screen reader uh, just gets like heading level one uh, announced for every heading. There is no heading structure, right? It's all level one. So the, right. it's very easy to lose your place in a document. Yeah. And this is very not straightforward even to come up with a plan and like what are the implications and how bad are those implications? Because that's true, but also it's true that that would be the fallback behavior for people and it was deemed to be kind of okay and the reason that it was deemed to be kind of okay is that basically what you get like what we think of is an outline but most at doesn't have really an outline what they have is more like the result of query selectors yeah so they have like here are a collection of h2s and here are a collection of h1s and that kind of thing right so just being able to know that it is a heading is the most important part. And it is in part that way because today headings are screwed up. And part of the reason that headings are screwed up everywhere is because, well, very frequently you can't even know. And so anyway, I, we get to many, many years. We did finally remove just in 2022, the document outline. And that was sort of like, most of it, but there have been even more. There have been things like trying to remove most recently in Firefox, trying to remove the H1 styling experimentally to see if we can actually get rid of it. it it's interesting because it's been stuck and it, it's tried to restart a number of times because there's a clear need 
But what makes it really, really hard, I think, is that everything has tried to solve this problem of how do you create the new thing and just make it work in documents that are the old thing. And it seems to me that is kind of the problem. Yeah. You lost me there. Can you say that again? Yeah. So when I say the old thing, um, like there is no document structure, right? Like even those AT, they don't have a, a document structure necessarily as the main way of sort of viewing a document. You know what I mean? Like there's parts of the structure that you can call out and jump to, but not necessarily an actual structure. And so you can have 12 divs deep H1 and then mm -hmm. pop out of that back to the root and have H2. And that's completely fine in HTML. Right. That like, that will pass a validator that will pass a validator and to most people that's totally fine right like that mm -hmm. h1 doesn't matter how it's structured it's the h1 that is in document order before the h2 and that's all that matters right right there's also the issue that if you try and do automatic outlines and say your first section has three headings so you've got an h1 an h2 and an h3 or you've got an h1 and two h2s uh, like what does the next section do and and when you say it out loud it sounds simple but what you're effectively doing is like having to retraverse the entire dom to find the elements between the last section and the current section mm. and that could be thousands of nodes that could i mean in theory that could be hundreds of thousands of nodes it, it's like this depth first traversal problem right where you kind of have to scan the whole document to find that layout you you could use advanced techniques like query selectors and stuff to try and help, but it's still a fairly complex problem to solve. And with every step of complexity in the browser becomes this area of more and more edge cases that people may run into. I don't know. I, I'd say my general rule of thumb for like web platform features as someone who doesn't often do a lot of this stuff, but it seems like the more complex, the harder it is to land the more dissatisfied users are with it because hmm. it, they generally don't, don't compose that well. Mm -hmm. This is sort of what I mean about the sort of mixed mode, because like if we had headed it off at the pass in 1991 and said, okay, before we let this escape the laboratory, <laughs> we have to fix this problem so that the only way that you get deeper headings is like everything has to be structural, right? Like you need this right. section marker and H1 and that that's all you have. Um, not H1, just H, sorry. Right. <laughs> then it would be fairly trivial for the browser to keep track, I think, because you only would, like, even if you had to calculate it on demand, you only have to walk to the root. At, at worst case, you have to walk to the root mm -hmm. upward. And that's what every single CSS selector does. So we, we, like, we can do that, you know? Right. Uh, it's a right. short path. It's always a short path that's where a, a solution is tenable is like if you can just walk up the tree that's a viable option the problem becomes and you know even for simple documents it's like not the worst but browsers need to think a lot about the pathological cases where what happens if you have a hundred thousand nodes or you know even ten thousand nodes or even a few hundred nodes but you decide to mutate them a lot like, how do you recalculate that? If you're doing this depth traversal, mm -hmm. querying all heading elements and trying to like walk backwards from there and restructure it, it gets very complex uh, very quickly yeah. when you start talking about all of the edge cases. And and like, that's where browsers live, right? Is all of the edge cases. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever looked at a spider web, it's all edges. <laughs> uh, yeah, and like you say, if you're if you're changing the DOM a lot, if you have content that's dynamically changing and even structures that are dynamically changing it becomes very difficult very quickly yeah we, we kind of have that in browsers and that's like css and css layout is incredibly complicated we don't want to have another kind of css layout scale of problem on our hands uh, with something like document structures so i, I can see why with with multiple heading levels and uh, trying to apply those to sections i can't see where it would work and then the next problem is 
to get there, you have to break the web. And that is an untenable goal because yeah. we, we can't do that. We can't suddenly deprecate H2 to H6 and say, sorry, everyone, you can't use these anymore. Right. But um, you have an intent to prototype of a possible solution. Yes. Yeah. So, so you opt in on any, any element by adding a heading offset. Uh, so you add a heading offset to any kind of element. And if that element contains an H1 to an H6, then it will traverse up the tree, collect all of these heading offsets, accumulate them, and that then gets added to your H1 to H6. So if you had an H1 and its parent was heading offset 1, that becomes an H2. Or if it has two heading offsets of 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1, that H1 then becomes an H3, and so on. So it's like an opt-in mechanism. It still kind of preserves your H1 to H6 tags. Mm -hmm. And I think the key simplification is that it is just a traversal upwards in the tree. Like it just accumulates these attributes going up. So in the GitHub case, when you're on the main page of a repository and it has a readme and the readme has an H1, you're going to wrap the readme with a heading offset of one, I assume? Yes, exactly. Right. So and whatever then, the heading levels are in that readme, they get bumped down, I guess, by one. By one, exactly, yeah. So you as an author uh, writing a readme, you'll use markdown heading level one, mm -hmm. and that would be your readme, starts at heading level one. And if we put it on uh, github.com, on a repository page, it will be wrapped in heading offset one, making that H1 and H2. And then on NPM or VS Code, there will be a different heading offset so that your H1 might be an H3 or an H4, depending on the context, which means that you don't need to think about it. You, you just continue to write H1s. And most people write H1s when they start their own piece of user-generated content. Right. But most people writing comments will start with an H1, unknowing that that is like the incorrect document structure. There are, there are quite a few people who are aware of the existing document structure in GitHub who will start their comments at H3. Those people will have to change their habits, I guess, once we fix this issue. But there is, we also have an extension. I'll have to find the link for it, but we have an extension that demonstrates this issue and it will style all of the headings on the page with a little marker saying what heading level they are. Mm -hmm. It respects things like ARIA level. And we use that internally to test the accessibility of the page and like document structures of the page. So when I look at GitHub, every heading has like a little golden H1, H2, H3 next to it. This is this is a really interesting thing because it gets to a, a thing I had in the notes that I wanted to point out that this is basically the opposite approach of the document outline in the sense that this is only about semantics. It is not about style. So the style yeah. won't change. So... My plan beyond heading offset, uh, I don't know how viable all of this is, but I, as I understand it, these are all tenable. But my, my plan past heading offset is to add a heading pseudo selector that will give you the computed heading level. Um, so if you had an H1, but it's inside of a heading level start two, it will match a pseudo selector like colon heading level three because it's that two plus one so you can in your own documents style them uh, such that they match the heading levels that your existing style sheet expects so you mm -hmm. would just extend your style sheet to say like right now it says h1 font weight size one or something in the future you might say h1 comma colon heading one and the rule is size one or whatever yeah, what I meant was that um, from the implementation point of view, you're focusing on not uh, yeah. visuals, right? So okay. there won't be, at least in the short term, a UA style sheet rule that changed that for you automatically. Right, yeah. Uh, this only affects the AT nodes. In terms of the actual implementation, like the way browsers work under the hood, as is my understanding, at least. I'm still very new to all of this, but um, they have a separate uh, accessibility tree. Mm -hmm. And the accessibility nodes are in some ways simpler than HTML nodes. They're all of one kind of interface and stuff, but they, they expose a different set of properties. And so one of the properties that they expose is level. 
and that level is computed and literally inside of all of the browsers there's just a switch statement that says if the html tag is h1 then the level is one if it's h2 the level is two and so on and there's a conditional clause above that that says if aria level is set then the uh, level is the aria level so the the code inside each of the browsers effectively says if aria level is set then return that uh, but cap it to between one and nine otherwise look at the tag name and uh, there's a switch statement that says h1 return level one h2 return level two and so on and so every accessibility node uh, will have a level if it's a heading that relates to either aria level or the tag name and so we just come in and say well if aria level is not set just look up the tree do a tree traversal and look for all of these heading offsets and accumulate the level based on that and so if it's an h1 the switch code becomes like rather than if h1 return one it's if h1 return one plus whatever the accumulated result of this calculation is and that's the only change so far and so so head, heading offset will only do that change it will only change the accessibility tree and then we can use other techniques like a colon heading selector mm. or something similar to extract that data but it, it's not going to change the tag name it's not going to change like style sheets there'll be no built-in user agent style sheets but there will be options hopefully to style it yourself it almost sounds like what you could use is an aria heading pseudo selector i mean i'd say that just because if the browser is already computing aria heading levels and this approach modifies the aria heading levels just look at that yeah I I actually have a question. You said that ARIA heading levels are capped from one to nine. Yeah. that That's three more than I'm used to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually have no idea why they go up to nine. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer, but yeah. Totally fine. Um, so then with this heading offset, I presume that you can only offset things as far as level nine and then everything sort of piles up at level nine. Okay, so I mean, we're getting a little into the minutia, but I'm more than happy to do so. But um, let's do it. Yeah, the the way aria level works is you can set aria level one to nine. If you were to try and set aria level ten, that would not work. Instead, you would get an aria level of, I believe, two. Two. Yes. Uh, Make yeah, perfect this, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of those weird things. Uh, with aria like there's a load of history here and i don't know all of it i'm kind of new to the scene right so i i get to see the present day and go why why is any of this <laughs> like this but um as so many of us do <laughs> yeah. at some point or another why yeah. is it wait and the answer is usually because that's what mosaic did but probably not in this case it no it yeah it's um to clarify a little bit on so if you're not using h1 or you're not using any of the headers. If you were to like roll your own header, it doesn't matter what the tag name is, as long as it's a tag name that allows a roll of heading. And that's how you would create a heading, is you would say roll equals heading. And that will expose that heading as a heading to the accessibility tree, this like totally different tree aside from the DOM. By default, in ARIA 1.0, and I think 1.1, that defaulted to a heading level of 1. And then for some reason that I don't know, it was either 1.1 or 1.2, ARIA 1.1 or 1.2 changed it to be heading level 2. So if you had a div role heading and you didn't set ARIA level, it just defaults to 2. Huh. I wonder if this is to do with some kind of idea around like hearkening back to the document outlines and maybe there was an intent to like, you know, H1 is the de facto heading unit or something. I don't know. But that's that's where we stand at the moment. So if you have a role equals heading, it defaults to heading level two. If you set ARIA level, you can set it to the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If you set it to a number 10, it will ignore ARIA level. And so it falls back to the role heading, which is the default of two. Um, okay. So, so yeah, there's it's not a it's not the best. <laughs> I want to say it's not the best API. It's it's lumpy. Okay. It's a bit of a lumpy API. I wanted to add really quickly to that, that um, every once in a while we get somebody like Scott O'Hara or Steve Faulkner or 
you know, somebody who like does a survey of checking this. And as of pretty recently, I think anything over six, like, you can't really trust it. It's not reliably exposed to AT. That's the other big problem is that what browsers do and what like assistive technologies do are two different things. And so a browser might tell the assistive APIs, this is a heading level nine. But that doesn't necessarily mean that JAWS or Narrator or VoiceOver or any of these other assistive technologies are going to announce heading level nine. They might announce something different. And so there is a discrepancy. There's that kind of border between like what you expect your HTML to do, what the browser will actually do, and then also what the assistive technologies will actually read out. And, and this is something that hopefully a tool like Web Platform Tests can resolve on at least the browser side, um, although there's some additional complexities there because I don't think at the moment the computed level is exposed in such mm -hmm. a way that web platform tests can test them. Stay tuned for a future show on that. This is kind of one of the wonderful things about working on a project like this is uh, making the change is kind of easy, but making the changes to make the change is where the real challenge is. And mm -hmm. so like we, we've prototyped this heading offset in Chrome and we have a patch and it, kind of works fine can't see any major issues with it but now it's how do we get that into spec pros how do we make the changes in the other browsers how can we look at cross-platform testing for all of these things and also ultimately when it's implemented is this something that assistive technologies are going to use you know, because we're using the same OP apis hopefully it is mm -hmm. i don't see a good reason why it wouldn't but there is a potential challenge there as well so it's a huge cooperative task, more than an engineering task, I think. As most standards issues are. Yeah, yeah. I, and I actually, I, so I want to go back and clarify something just real quick. If you try to set a heading level of 10, it falls back to two <laughs> because because of the way that that yeah. developed over time, right? At some point, someone said, we're going to have all of the headings default to level one, and then that got changed to everything defaults to level two, and then... With this, you can set from one to nine. If you go outside of that, rather than clamping to the nearest value, it just ignores it. And so you fall back to the fallback behavior and you get a two. So let's say I have an H6 and there are five offset levels above it, which would push it to an 11. Yeah. So our intent is to uh, clamp. Okay. So, so the maximum it will go is to nine. And, and it won't be surprising that if you end up in a combination that's greater than nine that it clamps to nine so you won't suddenly have each twos appearing in the yeah room. that that seems like a failure mode to me that's like a bug yeah right? we we don't want to to go there we want this thing to be intuitive ideally you know ideally people would test their document outlines yeah. but like reality is sometimes a little different and so we we need to make sure that we're we're giving people the best opportunity for success there yeah, and I mean that's the thing. They can test their document outlines, but you know, if it's a README and they happen to get down to let's say H5, and then like you said on GitHub, that's okay because it's probably only going to push them one level and they'll get to six. On npm or wherever, it might get pushed three levels, and then you're you're getting up against that limit. That's kind of the thing by setting up this system to say, hey, you don't have to really worry about the context anymore if it goes somewhere else, then that's okay. It'll be handled for you. That does open that door. So yeah, yeah. like you say, you, you are designing it so that in this case it clamps rather than falls back, which is, which is great. Right. Yeah. I, I think there was some commentary in the proposal issue. Oh, I should point out this started as a proposal by Moan who used to work for GitHub, a brilliant engineer. Moan proposed this back in, I think 2019. That's right. And it was originally heading level start, and the, the name has changed a few times since then. There's been a lot of feedback on the issue, I think, because there's different ideas. And like at GitHub, we have one very solid use case, which is this idea of we have markdown surfaces that contain user generated content, and we just want to like align those to the rest of the document. But we're in control of the rest of the document, and so we can mm -hmm. properly structure that. I think throughout the issue, it became evident that there is this case of embedding other documents fairly ad hoc, I guess. So uh, the most usable thing we could do is this kind of accumulative model. So 
it starts accumulating as you walk the tree, right? Every heading offset adds up so that the whole document outline has this kind of accumulation. Uh, there was a, a thing that I wanted to say like very, very early when you were describing this initially, uh, where the, you know, when you talk about like the user generated content, there is a an aspect of that that's just like very straightforward. It's like people who aren't from GitHub at all create content and goes up there. But then there's this other thing where like you also said like, well, we have people at GitHub who like start with H3 or H2. They're doing that because they're trying to account and adjust. So like even though technically GitHub owns the whole document and they can somehow coordinate like it's not easy to coordinate always right like you have like lots of different templates lots of different layouts and because especially because the way that html works is like i said you can put that h1 12 levels deep yeah and then somewhere else have your h2 and that's fine that can really screw things up. And that's why we wind up with so many things that are messed up. And so I think in a sense, GitHub has both use cases, just that one of them is more acute and like, there's no way to deal with this otherwise. Um, yeah, Be because especially, I mean, we could rewrite the user's markup for them. Uh, but one thing it, that makes that problematic is it, that's kind of confusing for users. Mm. Um, but the other more serious problem is that it isn't just github that we put readmes on they they're, they're mm -hmm. everywhere right they're in yeah. npm other websites can use them you can open them in vs code and you can preview them in vs code mm -hmm. and each of those comes with a different initial document outline you know we can't just say every readme starts at heading level 3 because it depends on where it is embedded into the document but like a lot of the feedback in the issue was around this idea of embedding documents in other documents and how we can get a usable uh, feature that kind of just works, that kind of does what you expect it to. And so, you know, you could have like five embedded documents by quoting some other blog post in your blog post or like mm -hmm. comment threads or something. And each of those needs to be additive so that you do get this structure and it walks the tree. So I have a technical question. It might be two technical questions in one. So it's heading offset, you said, and that's expressed as just a integer. Yes. Yeah. C can you do an offset of negative one? You can't use negative numbers. It okay. Has, so in in the HTML spec, they have different ways of parsing attribute values, and uh, the IDL reflection also is parsed. Uh, so it's worth pointing out that it's not just heading level start as an attribute, but it's also a property on the element. And that gets you like an integer back or a number, JavaScript number back. Okay. But the, the IDL reflection is long and it is limited to non-negative numbers in spec pros, which is a really awkward way to say positive numbers. Yeah. It's, it's the way to say positive numbers and zero. I assume. And zero. Yeah. Yeah. Since every element will have a heading offset, the vast majority of them will have an offset of zero. Yeah, you could almost imagine every element today having an implicit heading offset of zero. Yeah. And you can write that. You can have, have <laughs> heading offset equals zero on every element if you so chose. I don't know why you would, but that's you're welcome to. And the, the IDL by default will return zero, so you can detect whether or not it's... Um, I mean, it, it will be helpful for feature detection, but it's also like it will tell you zero if the attribute isn't present. Right. It's good that it's along so that when we make these adjustments, we can get heading level of a few billion. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So so you can't do negative numbers, hmm. uh, but you can put a plus sign if you so chose. Okay. And so it was Jake Archibald who suggested uh, we do heading level plus as like a micro syntax, like plus one. But I think the way it shakes out is using along with the, like all of the existing mechanics of HTML exist to make it easy to just do an IDL reflection of long. And, you know, if you want to put a plus in, you can, but it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I believe that Jake's proposal was because the original thing was just heading level start. It was simpler. Right. The original thing was simpler, or at least it read simpler. Maybe she had in mind the offset thing all along, but 
it, it seemed like it was like, well, just start at this one. That's it. <laughs> like, it's just really simple. Yeah. Uh, Moan's original proposal was very narrowly scoped to heading level start will be an absolute number. But but I think from feedback from the issue, it was deemed that maybe the additive model is the best way to go. From my perspective, I'm not particularly opinionated either way. And the more complex one seems to be the additive model. And I would prefer to try that and see if there's a good reason why we shouldn't do that rather than starting with an absolute model and then being unable to change that at any time. So what I love about the additive model is that it accommodates multiple use cases and a sort of an evolution path, I guess. So so like if you have some big complicated existing site today and you have this problem where it's like, right here, I'm going to put some markdown. <laughs> yeah. Then it's like pretty easy because you know the structure of the site and everything. And you can say, ah, well, heading offset three. Perfect. You don't need to do anything. That gets you pretty good. But, you know, there is that problem of we have these complex template assemblages and somewhere off in header fragment.html, <laughs> somebody decides that like, oh, yeah, should change this thing. That was a mistake. This should get rid of this H2. Doesn't really belong there. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because and and now that number is not valid anymore, right? Yeah, you're not going to go and change all of the exactly. markdown uh, documents that you had to adjust their heading stru structures just because you uh, exactly. decided to remove a heading or add a new heading. Exactly. So so this is a good solution to just be able to do that and. It's way better than it is today, but like the problem of recomputing all the things in the document is still there. Like you, you still have to babysit the document like pretty carefully, and it's still prone to some troubles like that. But if you have a brand new document, you can make it use structural headings, and then you will never have that problem again. <laughs> yeah, and my hope beyond that is that we could reintroduce just the bare H element as an alias to H1 or maybe h0, pro probably h1. Mm. But if we just had an h that people could outline their documents with, which I, I obviously that was the original intent behind document outlines, um, but maybe coupled with this heading offset feature, maybe we could get there again. Oh, interesting. So would, is, yeah. is, is your idea that anytime you use an h, it would implicitly cause a heading offset of one to the parent i think it would just be an h1 but then you could structure your document using containers with the heading offsets appropriately so that your document is authored more around the series of containers rather than the headers which i believe is the kind of original intent of the the document outline structure hmm. so so in in the future the distant future when we all have the flying cars that we've been finally been promised, um, we'll just be writing H tags. We won't be writing H1 and we'll have a heading offset attribute. Who knows? Maybe even we can uh, make an implicit heading offset, have a new section element that has the implicit heading offset. So you're doing this for GitHub, but why, I mean, why does GitHub want you to do this? I think a big part of this from GitHub's perspective is we want to make GitHub an accessible home for developers. We want it we want it to be the most accessible home for developers on the internet. We have an accessibility commitment. You can read more about it on accessibility.github.com. We're interested in like making sure that it is the best that it can be. This is like a small part of uh, many larger parts that we're doing to make sure that GitHub is as accessible as it can be. Okay, so you have this problem, I assume that it's like one of 80 bajillion problems <laughs> that yeah. uh, like every engineering team is, is thrown, like how solve this impossible problem. And, and you have a backlog of impossible problems, right? What was the thing that led to this one getting picked up? Like who stood up and said, this is, this is the thing that we need to do or whatever. So every quarter at GitHub, we have a hack week and in that hack week, we can kind of pick our own projects to work on. At the end of the last quarter, uh, we wrote our proposals down 
and they don't need to get approved or anything, but we just kind of do that to solicit other GitHub employees. And so I mentioned this as something that Moan was pushing for a while. And then Clay Miller, who is an accessibility engineer on uh, GitHub, uh, was interested in this issue as well. And I mean, Clay's been great. Clay's done most of the implementation work. Um, he's built out a polyfill for the current iteration using this heading offset and, and so forth. Oh, that's awesome. Where can we get that? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I want it. Yeah. I'll drop a link uh, in the notes, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, I could literally use that on my personal website where I yeah. had to write an entire WordPress plugin just to try to start to do this. Same. And yeah. I, I, I would remove a whole bunch of code from my website. Yeah. Awesome. He'll be uh, very happy to know that. So like I've got a little bit of experience doing some of this stuff. I mean, I helped out with like custom state set and a few other things. And I'm really interested in evolving the web platform. I think it's like a really a super useful part of our tool set that we maybe take a little bit for granted. And I do think it needs more funding. And I do think a lot of these issues, I think, just need a little bit of energy put into them. Um, there are so many issues on the like Wattwig HTML repository, so many issues that engineers face with browsers every day. But I think that there's a little bit of a, a jump to get over, which is that like you can fix those issues, right? All of these browsers are open source. You know, there's fantastic companies like Egalia who are there to resolve issues, to help push proposals. I think more companies should be doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, I wanted to say one thing in closing, which is to give GitHub some props for doing that work upstream and like actually working on proposing the standard and uh, because you could easily have stopped at a polyfill, right? Because the polyfill will solve your immediate need. Obviously, it's better if you can get rid of that code and not do it in JavaScript and all that kind of stuff. But you know, realistically, many, many companies do not push the work upstream and make it the situation better for everyone. So props to you and to GitHub for taking that up because you're absolutely right. I have written a, a bunch of pieces about this, but there's one on my blog that's beyond browser vendors that, you know, talks about exactly this. And actually, Eric gave a great talk about this as well. There are just a million issues that are out there waiting for attention. And that's also why they don't get attention because just this overwhelming pile of stuff and you have to really choose what you pay attention to. And so when somebody comes along seriously and um, they bring with them some ability to do spec work and implementation work, suddenly, you know, other people say, well, maybe we should pay attention to that one because we might be able to get it to go somewhere, you know? And I think you're right. Just a little bit of energy really helps. Yeah. Yeah. Massive kudos, or as uh, some of my Brit friends say, kudos <laughs> to GitHub for supporting this, right? Like your time is not free to them. The work that you do on this is work that you're not maybe doing on something else. And yes, it helps GitHub, but GitHub is also supporting this work. They are meaningfully like financially giving this support. And so that's great. A, more companies should do that, but it's really great that GitHub is doing that. And it's awesome that you are taking advantage of that in order to push this forward to make the web better for everybody and not just for GitHub and its users. Yeah. yeah you know, as far think... as implementations and other browsers, you asked, how do we get them? Uh, give us a call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for GitHub, it's, GitHub is the home for all developers, and that doesn't just stop at building our own stuff. We want to make the developer industry better as a whole, and that means working out in the open on open source, contributing to open source, uh, contributing to web platform, the, the whole lot. Hear, hear, and amen. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming on, Keith. It was a great talk. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Is there any place people can find you on the internet? I'm around. You should uh, you should check out uh, Moan, who originally wrote the proposal, who is on the internet as M U A N on like all the various socials. Clay Miller's been doing excellent work on the prototype, and he's on the internet as Smockle S M O C K L E, 
Uh, I'm on the internet as Keith Amus, K E I T H A M U S. But yeah, you should you should follow those folks because they're they're the real heroes in all of this. I'm just the front man. GitHub is on the internet as GitHub. G I T H U B. Yeah. It's a capital H. That is the one thing that has been instilled into me over the time is that uh, it is indeed a capital H. Capital G, capital H. Got it. Yes. All right. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>